Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, we just thank you that we can fellowship here and that you've given us this time to praise you and to honor you and that each year we grow closer to you, Lord. Mm-hmm. Father, we ask now that you continue to go before us. Holy Spirit, you know the path that we as Amazing Grace Fellowship will grow to and establish. We thank you for the brothers and sisters that have passed through our doors and have gone on to ministry in different areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that chance we had to nurture those who are going on before us. Father, we just thank you now. Pray for Hope Fellowship at Waikoloa. We Mm -hmm. thank you that they too are growing and that you've blessed them that, you know, the businesses there leaving the area, but that opened up place where they can set up a church. Mm -hmm. Father, we just thank you for that. Give us the grace now to continue to move on to glorify you in whatever path you called us to, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Today, we're going to step away from the book of Galatians and go to the book of Acts. I told you last week, we looked at how the flesh and the spirit are always at opposition with one another. Any of you can give an amen to that, how your flesh fights against your spirit. Your spirit wants to do the right thing. The flesh is going, no, I don't want to. And... um, They're always duking it out. We talked about the white dog versus the black dog. And it came down to a real simple thing. Which one do you feed more? Which one do you train more? If you feed your flesh all the time and they go into battle between the flesh and the spirit, I guarantee the flesh will gain the upper hand. But if you starve that flesh and you feed the spirit, you're going to come into a new dimension of your Christian experience. You're going to start to see your spirit overcome the flesh. That's what Paul is exhorting the church at Galatia, the regions of Galatia, the churches there, to start to do that. And they could they could actually become victorious over the flesh. Now, I don't know about you, but as a new Christian, the, I, I think I could, I, I knew the days the flesh won because that was all the time. But uh, when the spirit finally won, I was like, woohoo, it's a big day and uh, an awesome day. And, it, and from that day forward, I realized, you know, I don't have to be doing what this flesh says i can i can walk in newness of life now like uh I, i'm dead to the flesh when i got baptized in jesus and now i get to walk a new life it's all about a new right a, a new life in christ and a lot of believers struggle with this because they forget that they joined themselves to christ when they got baptized and and paul said it in romans 6 you join christ in two things in the likeness of his death first so that you could join him in the likeness of his what? His res- resurrection, in the newness of life. So you too might have newness of life. And, you know, a lot of Christians I run to are not walking in newness of life. They, I mean, you, see, even, even I hear people say about them, well, why should I be a Christian? They're no different than I am. And if that's the case, then they really aren't walking in newness of life. But I told you last week, we would go to the book of Acts this week on our special 27-year anniversary for a, for a special message of the how-tos of day by day. How do you actually do it? Because people say to me often, oh, pastor, I- if I had happened to me what happens to you, then I would know God is real. Then I would, you know, then I could walk after the Spirit. Then I could do all these things. I'm like, uh-uh. This <laughs> Wait a minute. We need to back up a little bit. You want to do those things i got to show you something that I learned. And, and I didn't start off being a pastor. I started off being a, a volunteer youth leader at a little Calvary Chapel in, in Verde Valley, Cottonwood, Arizona, it's called. It's like a dot on the map. More people know about Sedona, about 16 miles away, than they do about Cottonwood. And, uh, and that's where I got to serve the Lord, introduction to ministry. Now, I just realized that was in 1979-80. So I made 40 years this year of serving the Lord, and uh, 27 here, and I just go, Lord, you know, you've been f- so faithful. Uh, you know, when people keep saying that to me, I think it kind of, I got to share the secret how I do it because I don't think it's a big secret. I think I learned it because I was one of the deacons, you know, serving in the church, and 
I kind of copied stuff I read in the Bible. You know, I, I read the story of, of these deacons, the first deacons that were appointed. Does anyone remember the story of the first deacons appointed? I told you you could read ahead in Acts 6 through 8 about the very first deacons appointed in the early church. And they had a really special job. And um, there were seven of them uh, appointed to this job. Anyone recall what the job was, just out of curiosity? That they were going to be waiters, servants of food to the Hellenistic widows that were being overlooked in the daily service of food. A Hellenistic means the Greek widows. Now in Jerusalem, remember the gospel began its big splash there in Jerusalem and, and kind of like a stone splashing in a pond, it, it would make a ripple. You know how it goes out in the rings? And, and, and it would, Jesus said in the, in the first part of Acts, Jesus said, you guys wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And you'll be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, then the next circle out is Judea, the region around Jerusalem. Then what's the next part? Samaria. And then to the remotest parts of the earth. And so the, the, the book of Acts opens with the, with the early church waiting for that power. You can read Acts 1 to, to 5 and you'll see that some cool things went down. I mean, they're sitting there waiting to, to, to have power from God. And they ask the Lord. This is, it, it begins with before Christ ascended. He's already resurrected. He's been appearing for more than 40 days, showing himself alive by many convincing proofs we read. Remember, he ate the fish. He goes, you guys got anything to eat? And, and he goes, see, it's, I'm not a ghost. It, you know, he ate the fish, and it didn't do like Casper and fall right through him to the ground. He, you know, he says, it's me. I'm resurrected. So here, put your finger in the hole in my hands, and go ahead, reach in my side. Remember, he said that to Thomas. He, he showed them convincing proofs that it was him. He sat on the seashore when, the, the, when Peter and James and John had gone. He said, go meet me up in Galilee. And, they, and, and they're, of course, you guys knew what Peter and James and John did, right? Before they served the Lord. What, what was their occupation? Fishermen. So you put fishermen next to a lake waiting for Jesus. What are they going to do? They go fishing. They go fishing all night. They catch nothing. In the morning, it says Jesus sat by a fire on the seashore. He called out to him, hey, haven't caught anything, have you? Nah, haven't caught nothing. Put your net down on the other side for a catch. Now you say, wait, I heard that story before. You should have. That's how he met them the first time on the sea after they had fished all night and caught nothing. And you'll remember the first time he said, go ahead, put your nets out, and, and, and this time you get a catch. And they caught so many fish that their nets were breaking and their boats were full and sinking. And Jesus said, leave it behind. Now I'll make you fishers of what? Of men. And they come follow me. And then, here it is, three years later after he's died, and, and they're just getting the news he's resurrected. And he goes, i got to show you that you guys will know it's me. Go ahead, put your nets on the other side. And they do, and they come hauling in this hall. And only a fisherman would tell you this. In John's Gospel, it says, And we caught 157 fish, and yet the nets did not break. You say, who counted? Oh, probably Peter, James, or John, any one of them. But what was the sign to them? You remember when they caught the, the fish, Peter goes, It's the Lord. <laughs> I seen this before, three years ago, and he was stripped for work. He p puts on his outer robe and he jumps in the sea and swims to shore. He said, "John might have beat me in the foot race to the grave, but I'm beating him in the swim portion, you know, biathlon." And he swam and got into Jesus first, and Jesus already had food prepared, and he said, "Come eat." And he said, he just reminded him, "I called you to be fishers of men." not a fish. So Acts opens with them waiting. And they ask a question. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 1, I'm going to highlight a couple verses from verses chapter 1 to ver uh, 5 before we dig into 6 to 8 today, just to kind of set the tone of the book of Acts for those. we got some that are newer in the faith. A lot of you already know all this stuff. It's just review for you. But they, he gathered them together in verse 4 and he said, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for what the Father has promised you, which he said, you heard from me. He said, for John baptized you with water, but not many days from now you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
So when they had come together, verse 6 tells us, this is Acts 1, 6. They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore your kingdom to Israel? And he said to, him, to them, it's not for you to know the times or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And to me, I just had to point out to you, in, in the Jewish mindset, us people out here in Hawaii... We are 12 hours time difference from Israel right now. So whatever time it is here in the morning, it's that time in the evening later in the day there. They're ahead of us. So they're, they're just 12 hours ahead, always. Don't have, we don't have daylight savings here. They don't have daylight savings. So <laughs> super easy for me to remember when I would call Brad Antilovich over there at Calvary Chapel, Jerusalem. You know, I just had to be careful not to call... <laughs> Call in too late in the day. Be tw I call at, at one in the afternoon. It's one in the morning, you know, for him. Like, oh, boo boo. Sorry about that, Brad. You know, but um, but you learn these things, and and to the Jewish mindset, being that we are halfway around the world globe from them, and we are the remotest piece of land. You all know this, right? Hawaii is the remotest piece of land from any other continental landmass. We qualify as the great fulfillment of this passage. You're my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even the remotest parts of Hawaii. We get to be included right here as that fulfillment to that very verse. And he says, so that's what you're going to be, my witnesses. Now, they waited. You guys know the story. The, they heard a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Not a mighty rushing wind that came into the upper room, but the sound. And tongues of fire came and descended on them, and they began to speak in foreign languages, in tongues. And all the people in Jerusalem were already gathered there, because, you know, it's the time of the holy time of the Sabbath, the, the, the great Passover time leading into Pentecost. And people traveled the whole world to come to Jerusalem at this time of year. And so... All these people from all over, the, all over the globe have arrived, and they start hearing the disciples. They go, wait a minute, that guy's speaking in my, my native tongue from, you know, I'm from Greece, or I'm from Italy, or I'm from... And they, they said, how can it be that these men each are speaking, you know, Par Parithians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia? In, in Acts chapter 2, verse 9, it says, those from... From, from Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and districts around Libya and Cyrene, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, all were hearing them declare the mighty deeds of God in their own tongue. They're going, it's impossible. These guys couldn't know all these languages. Now, how many of you believe God can make you learn a new language without trying? Is this hard to God? He goes, oh, I can't do that. You know, I only speak all the languages, but I can't help you out here. No, of course he could do that. He, that's what he did to open the book. This is how they knew that God's spirit was real. They started speaking in, in foreign language. Now, I call it cheating, because if any of you studied foreign language in school, you know. Was it easy? Most people are going, oh, I hated it. It was tough. English wasn't my first language, so I thought English was tough. But here, these guys are, are gifted, and they go, and Peter gives his first sermon, and he basically says, you crumbs killed Jesus, whom God sent to die for you, and you need to believe on him. He's the sacrifice promised. Now, it's a real simple message. You can read that yourself if you want extra credit tonight. You read Acts chapter 2, and you find out that after, after he gets done preaching, 3,000 people get saved from this simple message. Don't ever discount the simplicity and the power of the gospel message. Too many guys trying to make it too complex when it's really simple. Jesus died for our sins. That's the bottom line. And he, he threw it right on those guys' faces because they were the ones that were cheering on as they put him to death. But some were pricked, and 3,000 people get saved. Well, after that great in, influx of souls to the church, they... Um, Peter and John, the, it says that, that the people, I love this. Could you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 40 
2. Acts 2.42. They continually continue to devote themselves now to four things. And by the way, I always share this as a little side note here. If you're looking for a good church to be plugged into for your, you know, strengthening of your faith, or you have a friend that's saying, they're maybe they're on the mainland and they're going, what do you look for? I always tell them Acts 2.42. Look for a church that continually devotes itself to these four things. It, these are four core things that make a church truly have strength in the, in the fibers of their church. And look at what they are. First thing they devoted themselves continually to was the apostles' teaching, to the scripture, the word of God. You got to go somewhere where they teach the word of God. Don't, if, you, if they don't teach it, get out. Not a, not a healthy place to grow. Second thing, they continually devoted themselves to fellowship. You got to be in fellowship with other believers. No man's an island, right? Right, Jorge? We need each other. And they continually devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. They took meals together. Communion. The breaking of bread together. And the last thing they continually devoted themselves to, and by the way, this is the one the American church is weakest on, prayer. They were people of prayer. And because of it, God's Spirit was doing something cool. Look at the next verse. Everyone kept a, 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 a feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And those that had believed were coming together, and they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, no one said, hey, you have to go sell your stuff and share. It's because they devoted themselves to those four things first that God's Spirit pricked the hearts of those that had means that they took and they sold their stuff and they gave it to those that didn't have. Or they brought the things and shared them. As even our brother Jorge here, would you, would you stand for just a second, brother? This brother here is from our uh, fellowship up on the mountain, Grace Community, uh, Grace Community and uh, he does the Congos up there. And he has on his heart, he has a food truck. He's a chef. And he has on his heart to help feed the homeless. But he heard we fed the homeless, so he wanted to come see. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and he brought his drums too. <laughs> Get up here. <laughs> so instant in season and out of season. I like this guy. So he, he, he just goes, you know, you, it's just, he has it on his heart. Like, I like to bring some clothing down and, you know, put some racks up, you know, like different sizes, the small, the medium, the large, so people could get clothing. I go, you know, it's so cool that the Lord puts that in different people's hearts to do different things to help those. Some people work at the hotel. They bring me these big packages of those little soaps from the hotel, you know. We put those out today, tons of those soaps. All the homeless are, thank you, thank you, you know, and snapping up all the bars of soap, and you think, that's because somebody else had it in their heart. Well, that's what happened in the early church. They started bringing as each one had ability and those that had would bring and give to those that had not. And there was a sense of awe. The work of the Lord was happening. But no, it wasn't like a program. They didn't make a program to do this. They just did it because God's Spirit was moving. Now, that's when it's the sweetest. I found when it's the Spirit you know, drawing people to do things, that that's when stuff really happens. And day by day, they continued in one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those that were being saved. The church continued to grow. Well, if you know the next chapter... I can tell you that the apostles, how much money did they take from the till of what was brought? Anyone know? It's not a trick question, by the way. The next chapter tells us that Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. On the way going in, there was a beggar. He was sitting there begging alms. He had been lame since birth. And he, he um, you know, Peter looked at him. He'd been lame from his mother's womb, it said. And every day he was carried and set there as you went into the temple. And so Peter and John walked by, and they said, oh, yeah, we just got a bunch of stuff given to us. Let us give it to you, right? No, that's not what the story says. Peter looked at him, and he says, silver and gold have I none. So I know the apostles weren't dipping into what was being given. They, they had none of it. Now, some people 
say, well, they were the apostles. They should have taken some stuff. Hmm. I like Paul's attitude. He said, my hands have ministered to my needs and the needs of the men with me. I've taken nothing from you to preach the gospel. I always I admired that. I thought, if there'd be any way, Lord, I could be a preacher who never takes a penny from the gospel, from the from the box. All the all the money could be used for the work of the Lord, and you can sustain me however you want. I'll, I volunteer. He never lets me do it, but I want to do it. Okay, <laughs> it's like I, I I could I could get into that. You know, let the Lord do that. But these guys went up to the temple and. Peter goes, I don't have any money. Now, I always say this. If he had money, what would he have done? You see a beggar, you're going to pray at the temple, what would you have done? Pete, drop a few coins, right? Help the guy out. He's been lame there from birth. Lame from birth. Can you imagine how big his legs would be? Never walked? I've seen people who have been lame for their entire life, and it's just a bone with skin wrapped around. No muscle. Their muscle has never had to work. I saw an individual, their legs were like this big around. My wrists are bigger than their leg was. Except for the knees. It was interesting. The knee bone was big, but it was just bone covered with skin. And then there was two bones down here. You could see them individually because there was no tissue filling it in. It was just skin covered. And my heart just broke. Lord, oh, it's terrible. And the Lord reminded me of that individual so that I would picture this when they walked by this man. Been lame since birth. Carried there and set. Can you imagine the bed sores on the underside? I mean, just from sitting, not able to move. They carried his pallet and put him there every day. And Peter just comes up to him and goes, you know, silver and gold have I none. Sorry, buddy. See you later. No, that's not what he did. But such as I have, give I to thee. And what did he do? He reached down with his hand and grabbed the guy by the hand and pulled him to his feet and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. The guy had never walked. You guys know what happened, right? In the instant as he's being pulled to his feet, what did God do? The power of the Lord flowed through Peter, and that man's legs were, they, grew, they had to grow in. Uh, you, for those of you who don't believe God can do this, this is no big deal to me. Because I've seen, I've witnessed the Lord do this in front of my own eyes, praying over someone, and had him put their tissue right on their bone, right in my hand. But some people are like, well, that only happened back then. Not my God. Jesus Christ, it says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he made that guy's legs grow in. And the scripture tells us the man went walking and leaping and praising God all the way into the temple. And I always point this out for you, especially for the ones with YWAM that don't have any money. It seems like all the YWAMers are broke. And they come here to, to learn about the Lord's work. And they think, when I get money, then I'll go serve the Lord. Pfft, forget that. Go serve the Lord. The Lord will take care of the money. And maybe you're not supposed to have money because if you had money, maybe you would miss a divine appointment that you're really supposed to walk in. Because if Peter had money, I submit to you, he probably would have just gave the money and walked right by. But that guy would still have the same problem. But God wanted that guy to be restored and meet his need. So he used Peter's lack of provision to guide him into God's provision. What God wanted to do through Peter. And this is not popular in American culture to teach that God could use lack of provision to steer you into his provision. People don't want me to tell them that. I'm like, I'm sorry. Happened right in the Bible. To the apostles. They're the A team, A apostles. If it happened to them, can it happen to you? Could God make it where you don't have so that he makes you aware of something else that you do have? Do you have the Lord? Do you have the name of Jesus? Because all Peter said was, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus. Do you have the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. He pulls the guy to his feet, and the guy is restored by the power of the Lord on the way up. 
Now, if there was no power in the name of Jesus, this story would have read different. He'd grab him by the hand, pull him up, and he would plonk down on the ground, and his legs would have been all twiggy and might have broke or something. But, but there's power in the name of Jesus above all names. And that man was healed. And he went in, and great, guys, you talk about a buzz. Everyone went, isn't this the man that's been at the temple for all these years? Look at this. Just to show you, this buzz creates such a, such a stir that everyone comes around. They've got to see what's going on. And Peter gives his second sermon. <laughs> and he, and he, he literally opens with verse 12. Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? And why do you gaze at us as if by our own power we did this? Or by our own piety we made him walk. We didn't do this. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Verse 13, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. The one you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one. And you asked for a murderer, Barabbas, remember, to be granted to you. To, uh, uh, you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead. A fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in, the, in his name, it is the name of Jesus which this man has, has strengthened this man whom you see now. And faith which comes through him has given him perfect health in the presence of you all. Now... Brethren, I know you acted in ignorance, just also as your rulers did. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent. This is Peter's second, second message. Therefore, repent and return so your sins might be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and he might send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. Well, as he's speaking... The Spirit says they continue to move on their hearts. Just to sum up in, in chapter 4, the next chapter, verse 2, many of those that heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000 souls. They just added two more thousand souls from that easy sermon? Dude, i got to switch my sermon material. This is all accounts right here. Preaching Jesus what Jesus did. Souls are being added. This is for you, evangelist. Right here, stick to what Jesus did. And that day, they get threatened. <laughs> well, the, the, the high priest and the, and the leaders didn't like how many people were leaving and going and join, following these apostles. Yeah, a 5,000 crowd already, and Peter's only preached twice. And the, it says here, in verse 13 of Acts 4, they observed the confidence of Peter and John, but they understood they were uneducated and untrained. And they were amazed. They began to recognize them as men that had been with Jesus. They're like, these guys, they didn't even go to our schools. They're not educated like we are, and yet they have such a huge following. So they told him, shut up, quit preaching. And Peter answered him in verse 19 of chapter 4, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we heard. So they threatened him. And because they had no other further basis, they had to let him go. And it says in verse 22, for the man on whom the people, the people were glorifying God, verse 21 says, for what had happened, the, for the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Did you guys know that? The guy was over 40 years old being set there daily. Can you imagine for 40 years of your life being set there? where all the religious leaders passed by for their daily prayers. And not one of them said, hey, may God touch you and heal you and make your legs to work. Except this one apostle who had nothing. He didn't have money. Silver and gold have I none. But uh, such as I have give I thee. Now the congregation of those that believe, verse 32 of chapter 4 says, were with one heart, one soul. They didn't claim anything belonging to themselves was their own. And with great power, the apostles, verse 33 says, were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was on them all. And there was not, listen to this, there was not a needy person amongst them. This is what true love and grace does when the Spirit moves. He knows what people need and he knows how to endue some people with excess 
provision so they can share with those in need. And I, I don't know about you, but Paul said, is, I learned from the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to what? To give than receive. I always like that Paul put that in there because I like being on the giving side. I hate when I have to be so humble that I have to receive. I know it sounds like prideful, but, you know, God's still working on me. But he's put me in a lot of places where I didn't have a choice. Like the only way I could do it is if I humbled myself and received. I had to be on the receive. And it kind of, sometimes the Lord puts you in that way just so that you have to be humble when you, you, you got to understand how it feels so that when you give, you don't put that other person down in your giving. Some people are cocky when they give. They don't realize their, their haughty attitude is really dis, uh, not a bad taste in the mouth for the person having to receive from them. But when you can give in humility and love and the Spirit's leading, what a sweet thing, man. People's needs get met. And I just think, oh, I think the Lord wants to continue to do that work. Well, the next chapter is the story about the fate of Ananias and Sapphira. They gave for the wrong reasons, and the Lord sorted that out. And then in chapter uh, chapter six, they um, the end of it they start or cha end of chapter five they start telling um, the people you got to st stop preaching in this name of Jesus. They even lock up Peter. <laughs> that didn't work because an angel let him go in the night, and then he went right on preaching. And um, and yet then we read that at that time a complaint arose in Acts chapter six, and the disciples. It says the disciples um, said, you know, it's not really cool if we, if we neglect the things of the Spirit. So we'd like to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And verse 5 says this statement found approval with the whole congregation. They said, you know, uh, we, we, we understand there's a complaint that the Hellenistic widows aren't getting fed. But... Instead of us going and waiting on their tables, could we find men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom that, that could take care of this problem? And, and, and you know what's interesting? They didn't say, can we do it? They said, how about you guys do it? The congregation. Why don't you guys as the congregation, there's a problem here. Why don't you guys appoint seven men full of the Holy Ghost to tend to the problem? And this is where we get introduced to the first seven deacons in the church, appointed by the church, to take care of a problem in the church. I love it. It's Greek widows that are being overlooked in the service of food. And the church comes up with seven guys to take care of the problem. And I want you to tell me if you recognize anything unique about these seven names. Specifically, what's their origin? Are they Hebrew sounding to you? Aramaic? Greek? Do, just take a listen. It says they... Then chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Second, they chose Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Pimenus, and, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And when they had brought them before the apostles, they laid their hands on them and prayed over them. And the word of God kept spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests even became obedient to the faith. Anyone could tell me how those names sound? What, what nationality they are? Uh, I, if you haven't studied languages, you might not pick up on it, but I can tell you what they are. They're Greek. Every one of them is a Greek name. Why would you pick Greek young boys to make sure the Greek widows get fed? You got a problem in the church. They were feeding the Jewish widows, no problem. They, they weren't being overlooked. Is the Hellenistic, the Greek widows that were being overlooked. So what's the congregation do? They find young men full of the Holy Ghost, but they find Greek young men. I say, you guys take care of the problem. I think it's perfect. You know, Greek young men taking care of the Greek widows. Got this covered. The Lord knew what he was doing. And ironically, in the next chapter, one of them will be so endued with power from the Holy Ghost, he will give the best sum of, sum up of the entire Old Testament plan from God's perspective of the promised Messiah. If you, if you don't know the Old Testament well, but you need a, like a Reader's Digest, you just, want, you just want the bullet points. I need the bullet points from the Holy Ghost, what's important to know about the whole Old Testament. All you got to do is read what Stephen shared as a defense for the faith. 
to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders. He gives, you go, but it's a long chapter. It's like 60 verses. Yeah. Those 60 verses co cover all your whole Old Testament. Summed up in 60 verses. It's an awesome, powerful testimony. I'm not doing that for the study today. That's another extra credit reading for you. But if you really are new to the faith or even old to the faith but need a little brush up on what you would share with the Jewish person that's important, the highlights of the faith, you just look at Stephen's defense. Now at the end of Stephen's defense, we're told they were cut to the quick when he spoke. The, the, the Spirit of the Lord gave him such utterance that they rushed upon him and they stoned him to death. And the end of the chapter ends with Stephen the first of the, of the seven deacons getting stoned to death. And he cries out, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, at the chapter ends with verse 60, saying, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And having spoke this, he fell asleep. Now, you're Philip. You're number two of the seven. <laughs> and you just watched your number one pick get stoned to death. He just got killed. What does Philip do? Who can tell me now? Chapters, chapter 8, we, we, we read that after Stephen is uh, 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 put to death, Saul was in heart, uh, hearty agreement to putting him to death, and so he began to persecute the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered through all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So guess where Philip ran? Though? He winds up running off to Samaria. And we read in the scriptures, therefore, those that have been scattered, verse 4 of chapter 8, went, to, went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and beca began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, they say down because I know if you look on a map, Samaria is above Jerusalem, and we always think up by north is up. But in Jew Jewish culture, Jerusalem is the high place, the high holy place. You always ascend to Jerusalem. doesn't matter if you're south of Jerusalem, north of Jerusalem, way east, west. Whenever you're going to Jerusalem, you always say, let us go up to Jerusalem. When you leave Jerusalem, you always say, let us go down from Jerusalem. It's, a, it's a kind of like a mark of respect. Some people have trouble with understanding the Middle Eastern culture on that, but that's what it's about. So he went down to Samaria, which is on the other side of Mount Ebal, which is north of Jerusalem. He's like over 30 miles away, and he comes to that little town of Samaria. Remember where Jesus sat with the Samaritan woman and asked for a drink? He said, why are you talking to me? We're, not, we're Samaritans. We're half-bloods. You, you Jews don't talk to us. And Jesus said, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for living water. And she's like, oh, I'll take some of that. But you'll never thirst again. Well, Philip goes up there and preaches Jesus. And what happens? A bunch of people get saved. And the apostles hear about it back in Jerusalem. And they go, oh, man, we better go up there and see what's going on. Because the Samaritan, now the Samaritans are in the club. I mean, it's bad enough the Gentiles are in the club, but now the Samaritans. And they go up there, and sure enough, the Samaritans have been baptized into Jesus, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. So, so the apostles laid hands on them. They received the Holy Spirit in this chapter. And then they're like, okay, they're in the club. And we read this that then they started back to Jerusalem. And they, meaning Philip, is now back joining Peter and John. They've just come. He, he fled Jerusalem, but I guess since Peter and John came to visit, he got bold again, so he went back to... Now, how many of you knew this, that, that Philip actually fled Jerusalem first? So a lot of people don't pay attention to this fact. He was actually... Saul is threatening and killing Christians and arresting them, and he was the one holding the robes while they stoned his f number, the number one pick, Stephen, to death. And so Philip, I, I suppose Philip is quite aware that his buddy got stoned to death. And Saul was in agreement. And Saul now has letters from the priests and is chasing down the Christians. And, and did you know that the early church, see, they were busy playing church, staying in Jerusalem. Except God goes, I need you to get out of Jerusalem and go to Judea and Samaria. And so what's he do? He allowed persecution to drive them out. You know, some people say, no, didn't they do an outreach program? Didn't they, like, appoint some missionaries and send them out? And not that I read. 
Seems like the outreach program was run for your life. <laughs> so I was out to kill you. And on the way, this young man who was a table waiter, for the, just, for the, just for the widows that were the Greek widows, he winds up being the guy who leads a bunch of Samaritans to the Lord. Philip the Evangelist slash table waiter. Except he left his ministry because, well, what tables was he waiting when he was 30 miles away in Samaria? He dug out on the, forget that ministry, that ministry's over, I'm going to go do something else. And so he, he, he goes, and, he, he, he goes and, 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 and is now being used by the Lord somewhere else as an evangelist. And he come, now he gets bold because Peter and John come. He goes back with them. Now this is the part of the story a lot of people know. But they didn't know the part that led it up to this. And I want you to pay attention to this part. Because this is the part people I can relate to. They say, yeah, well, if God would do this for me, like he does for you, then I would know. And I'm like, um, excuse me, right here. They started back to Jerusalem. And they preached the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans on the way. In verse 26, but an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, get up. Go to the south road, to the road that descends down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, guys, I've been to Israel five times. This is a, this is a spot that it would be like saying, go to the armpit of the region. It's a dry desert. There's nothing. And I, speaking as a desert rat, Arizona desert rat, born and raised, I know desert. This is desert desert, like Oasis, nothing desert. Go to the desert road out there to the south. There's right. There's nothing. You go south on that road. There's nothing out there. Just go down there. The angel. Now, if an angel of the Lord appeared to you and said, "Go to the desert road," would you go? Or would you be like, "Well, why should I go? What's going to happen? Why should I?" Did the angel say any details about what to do, or just said go? He said, go. And I'm going to show you something really important for your Christian walk if you want to follow the leading of God's Spirit. It comes down to s one simple thing. Will you obey? Because a lot of Christians are like, well, I need to know the rest of the steps. He didn't give the rest of the steps. He said, go. When he got to the spot where God said to go to, listen to what happened next. So he got up and he went. Verse 27. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court of the official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning, and he was sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then, step two, then, after he already got there, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and said, Go up and join that chariot. <laughs> And Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand? Now, I can just picture this in my head. This dude's rich, okay? He's, he's the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. And he's, guys, to own a, a scroll of Isaiah, you don't understand. This, you had to have mega bucks back then. They didn't have printing presses and Bibles like we did. You, a, a scroll of Isaiah, how did they make one? By hand. Every jaw, every tittle rolled out. I mean, the scroll is, it's a continuous papyrus piece of, uh, of parchment rolled up on, a, on sometimes two dowels or one. It's huge. He has a whole scroll of Isaiah. It tells me he, he is picking up some expensive trinkets when he was visiting Jerusalem. And he's reading it and he, I don't get this. And I can just see this, the spirit of the Lord tells him, go join yourself to that chariot. Hey, buddy, how's it going? You understand what you're reading? I could just see him. He ran up, right? Chariot's moving along. I could just see him. He's running alongside him. Do you get what you're reading? No. How could I? Unless someone explained. Oh, yeah, that's a good part. I can't explain that. It says, and what did he say? Come on up. And from that very passage, he began to preach to him. Now, this is the passage he was reading. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who would relate his generation? For his life was removed from the earth. And the eunuch looks up at Philip and says, Please tell me, who does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip says, from this very verse, you guys know what he's going to say, opens his mouth beginning to preach the scripture, and he preaches Jesus to him. He's like, that's Jesus. That's not the prophet Isaiah. Next verse says, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip says to him, hang in there, I'm almost done. He says, nothing if you believe with all your heart. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he orders the chariot to stop. They both went down in the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no longer. But he went on his way rejoicing. And where did Philip find himself? Verse 40. And Philip found himself in Azatoz. Now, if you don't know Israel's geography, Azatoz, the closest that the river bends in the south, the Negev of Jerusalem there, to Azatoz, the closest bend is 17 miles as the crow flies. That's if they stopped at the first bend. If they continue down the road, it's almost 50 miles to Azatoz. Like the next, you know, like how uh, the way the bend thing goes. It doesn't matter to me either way where, I know they stopped when they got to water. I know the particulars say that he, he baptized the guy into Christ. And what did the Spirit of the Lord do to Philip after he got done? Snatched him away. Can you imagine the eunuch gets baptized, he pops up and then poof, Philip's gone. And, and this is before Star Trek. Okay? This isn't like beam me up, Scotty, and beam me over there. He, this is pre-Star Trek. I, I think, I, you know, maybe Gene Roddenberry read this and got inspiration for, you know, transporters because this happened in the Bible first. The Spirit of the Lord picked him up. Now, how many believe God could do that? Is that like hard? God goes, oh, this is really hard. I've got to pull really deep out of my bag of tricks for this one. Ah, come on. Nothing to the Lord. Picks him up, puts him down in Azatoz. The scripture says he went right on preaching the gospel all the way to Caesarea, which is all the way further north to the north part. And we don't read another thing about Philip until the end of the book of Acts where we read that he raised four virgin daughters that had kept themselves pure. We get his early life in the ministry and we get a really nice word of commendation about him in the later part. But he goes all the way to Caesarea. And you say, well, why Caesarea? We'll read the next chapter. When Paul finally gets whacked by the Lord and converted, they're going to try to now kill Paul. The church is going to send him away. And guess where they send him away to? Caesarea. They're gonna, the, <laughs> God goes, I got, a, Philip, I got an assignment for you. You're probably not going to like this, but I'm sending Saul, who I'm turning into Paul, and, um, you know, and then you're going to send him off to Tarsus, get him out of town, because he's going to now be persecuted for the faith, because he'll become a proclaimer of the faith instead of pro a persecutor. And the church will enjoy great peace after, after Saul gets converted. But the Lord needed to make the ripple start. And how did he get the ripple to start of the gospel moving? Through persecution. And how did he... Get them to further the work. Well, they didn't have any money to do it. So he used power, the power of his spirit. And how did he get the guys to do what they wanted him to do? Spoke to him through an angel. Spoke to him through, this, through his spirit. And the one part I want to point out to you about Philip that I love is Philip did whatever the Lord told him to do. Now, anyone here would volunteer to get to lead an Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord? And baptize him. You don't get to do any follow-up, though. Sorry, no follow-up allowed. It's just going to be a one-time encounter. You're going to introduce him to Jesus, and, and and just to make sure you don't get any mucking up of the of the you know you, man's plans of the five steps after you come to Jesus or whatever they come up with. He says, "I'm taking you out. You're going on to preach some more. I'll take care of the follow-up." Hey, by the way, are there any? Is there any Christianity in Ethiopia today? Is there any heritage of Christianity in Ethiopia? Do any of you know this? It's not a trick question. The answer is absolutely. 
Do we have any record of any of the apostles going to Ethiopia? None. Any of the deacons? None. Do you know the only record we have of anyone go bringing the gospel to Ethiopia? This guy is the only historical record we have, and all he knew was Jesus Christ was crucified like a lamb. And he brought that message, and he was the queen's keeper of her treasures. And today we have a great heritage of faith in Ethiopia from a man who only knew one part of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins. And he took all of it without opening his mouth. And I go, hmm. So who do, you, who do you give the, you know, like, if we're going to give, like, credit down line, you know, Jesus says, store up treasure in heaven. Who gets the credit for that? The Ethiopian? Or would it be Philip for going to the desert road? It's kind of like, who gets credit for all of the souls that Billy Graham led to the Lord? Someone was asking me this the other day. Who led Billy Graham to the Lord? I heard Billy Graham's testimony. He was sharing it with Greg Laurie one day. And he actually attributes his, his true seeds of faith planted in his heart, he says, because of his grandmother. He came forward in a, in a meeting later, but he said, it's because of my grandmother. Now I want to say, who gets credit for the souls? Billy or Grandma? <laughs> who led Billy? I mean, like, think about this. What if you only led one person to the Lord? I only led one person to the Lord. Who'd you lead? Billy Graham. W w anyone would like that on your resume, spiritual resume? Come on, man. You only led one guy to the Lord. Who'd you lead? Oh, this Ethiopian eunuch. How many people did he lead to the Lord? I don't know. A whole country. Works for me. Ho a whole country gets saved because he gets one, one, one deacon leads one guy to the Lord. Guys, don't downplay what God wants to do with you. If you just touch one person's life, you don't know what that one person will do. Never downplay that. And be willing to be used however the Lord wants to use you because that's when stuff gets exciting. You know, my wife and I were in Arizona and, the, and I was just the youth pastor. And then they started calling me the assistant pastor, associate pastor, all this. Basically, I just took care of people the same. And the Lord goes, you, go to Hawaii. And I was like, okay. Did you hear that? I'm telling the guys, did you hear that? God wants me to go to Hawaii. Ha ha. But he was telling me to do it. And I obeyed. And it was really exciting. And I was like, so people say, how do you, you know, now it's 27 years I've been here. Like, how do you know the Lord's with you? I, I go, man, I can tell you testimony after testimony after testimony what the Lord's done. Healings that he's done for people that needed a touch from his spirit restorations that he's done in people's lives, their marriages, stuff that only he could get credit for. And I go, it's really fun. It's fun, and I know this is going to sound weird, it can be scary, but it's fun when you obey, even if it is scary. I'm sure it was a little scary for Philip too, don't you think? Especially like, now that you know the details, do you think it was scary to go back to Jerusalem that you just fled from? And Saul's got the letter, and he's out persecuting Christians, and you're going to go with Peter and John back? And then when you get back, the, spirit, the Lord says, sends an angel says, uh, you, go to the desert road. But he doesn't tell you, hey, later you get translated. Oh, anyone want to get translated for the Lord? Like, would, would you be willing to do I, I always get a lot of hands on this one. I'll do that. You know, snatched up and put down. And my question is when I get to heaven, Philip, were you still wet from the water? When you landed in Azatoz, or did the Lord air dry you on the way? I mean, I know, I think really weird thoughts, but I think that's a, I got that on my list, you know, <laughs> when I get up there. Hey, did you, did you get there and you were like blown dry? Or were you like snatched out of the water, put down so fast and you're just wringing wet and everyone's going, where'd he come from? And you just went right on preaching, man, because I mean, what are you going to do? Well, it's exciting to be using the Lord if you listen to him step by step. But you're never going to see the translating day if you don't do the first stop when he says stop or stop and help that person. And you're like, but I don't know. Should I stop? It, if he's telling you stop and help the person, what do you do? Don't call me. Say, Pastor, I felt the Lord tell me to stop and help this guy on the highway out by Costco. And I'm like, I'm waiting for the, the yeah, and what happened? 
Oh, I didn't stop. I thought maybe you could go out there and help him. <laughs> I only show that because someone actually did that to me, and it was just annoying. I was like, the Lord showed you the person, and you had an opportunity, and you just w you drove right by. Do it when he tells you. Because that's, that's how I get the next step, is I do what he said that step, and then that leads to the next step. Now, some of you know I went to Arizona a couple weeks back. Well, it's actually been a, about a month back to see my daughter, Michelle, who's here with us today. Where are you, Michelle? Right there. And she was having a hard day, and I was like, um, I felt like the Lord said, just buy a one-way ticket. And I thought, no way, a one-way. You know, us pastors will always think like a little head for God because he doesn't know what he's talking about when he says buy a one-way. So I checked in, and I, Aaron had already told me he, he had asked if he could teach that following Sunday because they wanted him to teach at Grace Community in the following weeks. He wanted to kind of dust off the ring rust with us where he's used to everyone. So he's like, can I give the sermon next week? And I was thinking, great, because the Lord told me to buy a one-way on Monday. You'll have Sunday covered so I could stay till Saturday. That's how pastors think. How do we miss the least amount of Sundays and, and you know, keep everything covered? So I'm going to leave on Monday. I'll be back by not that Sunday, but the following Sunday. I'll come back on Sunday. So I look at the round trip, and it's $750 a piece for me and Jan. I'm like, Lord, that's too much. He goes, I didn't tell you buy a round trip. I told you buy a one-way. I say, but, Lord, that's bad. Like, and I, and, and you said, so I look and it's like 380, 370. I'm like, it's a rip off. You know, they're charged more if you cut it in half. And, and he goes, I didn't say Tuesday. I said, look, back up the little Expedia window to Monday. I back it up. It says $173 on Monday. And we were looking on Friday night for that next Monday. I was like, now you guys know from here to Phoenix, that's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good fare. We're like, Okay. And then the sister tells me, don't worry, just get here. I'll get you back when it's time for you to go back. Well, I didn't know that when he said get the ticket, but that came later. See, I should have just obeyed and got the ticket right away. I was like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. finally, okay, I'll get the ticket. And then we went. And then I wound up working like a, <laughs> I don't know why. I, some people said, how was your vacation? It wasn't a vacation. It was like a ministry opportunity <laughs> with a lot of ministry. I, if I look lighter, it's because I lost 10 pounds ministering. And it was hot desert and service. And I kept singing to myself, if you want to be great in God's kingdom. As I'm helping these people with stuff, I'm like, why am I here, Lord? He goes, you'll see. And so I just obeyed step by step. Okay, it doesn't make sense. I'm helping one lady, and then another person calls and says, Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm helping this gal. She's we, we know her from Hawaii uh, on the boat, and she got a new motorhome, and we're helping her get it outfitted. And I keep going to this place called Camping World to take her. And her motorhome came with nothing. You know how much money you have to spend to make it, a motorhome have everything it needs, like the tubes and the water and the electric and all that? And she just keeps putting it in the cart, and I'm like going, hoi, yi, yi. And... I show her, uh, I'm like, okay, and while I'm helping her, someone says, hey, what about your motor home? I said, I don't have a motor home. Well, didn't you want one? I said, yeah, when the VOG was bad, we were talking about, because you know that when the VOG was bad, a lot of people dug out here. You know that, right? I was thinking it would be a good time to take a sabbatical or something. I don't know. I can't breathe here. Remember, Sue, we were looking at the, the things. And I was like, come on, Lord, do something, you know, and now. I want to give my praise report. See that nice, clear horizon? Except when I got back, Mike DeCarly tells me, oh, yeah, I got my passport ready any minute because now Hawaii is, like, rumbling like crazy. And he's lived here 50 years. It's like his friend works for the geology thing, and he's like, oh, yeah, they're getting most activity ever. Not to scare you, but, you know, like, we only live on the fourth most likely mountain in the world to blow its cap. And, uh... I, if God told you tomorrow, get up and leave, and you live on the side of that mountain, would you do it? This is a question, just like a hypothetical. No, I'm not asking, you know, like Philip. Philip, you're, you're serving in the church there. You got a job in the church, and persecution happens, and he says, go to get out of town. Now, what if Philip wouldn't have got out of town? What do you think would have happened? He might have been one of the next guys arrested and killed for the gospel. But he's willing to leave what he was doing to follow the Lord. And the Lord led him 
to an appointment that led a bunch of Samaritans to Christ, which is awesome, which then led him back to Jerusalem, then led him out to the desert road, and then to the Ethiopian Union, and then to Azatos, then to Caesarea. And the guy got really used, but he didn't stay where he was. And I look at this message, and I go, okay, Lord, you send me here. And then the person goes, so what about your motor home? And I go, I don't have one. I'm helping this sister get her stuff all in order. Well, didn't you have one that you liked? I heard you had one you liked. They said, yeah, we looked at one, but it was way, I can't afford it. But I made a deal with God. I said, God, you know, Peter didn't have money, and you took care of him. So I'll just put it in your hands. And if you want to know how I see God do things in my life, I do it like this. It says we walk by faith and not by what? Not by sight. By sight stinks. Guys, if you want to walk by sight, good luck with your walk. It's going to be boring. You're never going to see the miracles because by sight is not how it works, right, Aaron? It's by faith. And so I went, um, yeah, we saw this motorhome in December and the, the lady was so nice and she said, we love... I, I told her, we love your motorhome, but we can't afford it. She goes, oh, don't worry. God will work it out. When we went back to see Michelle, these other people said, oh, what about your motorhome? I said, well, we love this motorhome, but we can't afford it. And she goes, oh, well, can we see it? Sure, I guess. I'll call the people. I call the people. They say, yeah. I go, I still remember the gate code. You have to, like, type in this thing, go in this secure facility. Can we go look at it? They said, of course you can. We go and we look at it. And... um. The guy will tell, I said, my father-in-law proves it's Green Bay Packers color. Now, I'm colorblind, for those of you who don't know this. So, I don't know. When you're colorblind, the first thing people do is, the sky is blue, the tree is green. I know that already. The grass is green. Yeah, I got that. So, she goes, this stripe is green. And she touches the motorhome. This stripe on the motorhome is green. This stripe is, like, gold yellow. This is, like, Green Bay Packers. I can see the screen. And then she puts her finger on for the third touch. And she goes, and this is supposed to be your motorhome. Without a pause. She's a Christian. She turns and goes, we're buying this motorhome for them right now. Didn't ask how much, nothing. Just, we're buying. And I had told the Lord, if you really want me to have a motorhome, Lord, I can't afford it, so you have to buy it. I was very specific. Like, I don't want to spend one penny. Because I had just watched this lady drop a lot of dough for all these tubes and the hook up the poop tube and hook up the water and hook, sorry, all the stuff you do for motorhoming. And I'm like, I don't want to do that, Lord. I said, the lady on the spot says, buying it for you. Now, someone's been asked me, how much was it? How much? Who did it? I want to know this person. How come you know that person? I don't know that person. I got news for you. They asked that they, on one condition, it would be anonymous. And that no amount would ever be spoken. I said, fine. I mean, they're just saying, like the Bible says, you don't let your left hand know when you give what your right hand is, Right? So don't ask me that question. I, you can pick at me all you want, and I'll give you the same answer. They did it unto the Lord, and as they're, you know, it's between them and God, and that's not for me to know. I don't even care. But when, but when they got the thing paid for, the people who had the motorhome said, well, Pastor, you can't leave with that motorhome. It, we had taken everything out to show it. it was, you know, they took all, the, all those pipes and all that stuff. They took it all out so it looked real clean. When we got there to pick up the motorhome, I opened the bay underneath it. So I had the big thing. It's gone full. And there's containers. This one has all the pipes. This one has all the fluids. This one has all the, the stuff you need for camping. This one has a grill in it. This one has the bottles for the grill. The, you know, and every single thing. These people said, we are not letting you. Go. And Jan goes inside and she opens the drawer and there's silverware. And there's dishes and plate and, and, and pans and you open the top and there's bins in there for the food to sit in. Because we couldn't figure out, how is the carpet so perfectly clean in the cupboards? There wasn't one little scratch. Down. She kept everything in these plastic tubs. She owned a restaurant. And so she had all these heavy-duty tubs. And she goes, you can't put the food in there. It'll rattle around. You put it in the tub, then you put the tub in there. And they fit just perfect. And like every single thing was provided. Jen and I went, <laughs> At bedding, oh yeah. She's like, and you're gonna need bedding. Here's two sets of, of sheets, and you're gonna, and you'll need a, a, a. We have this down comforter. You're gonna need that for cold nights, and you stuck that in the thing. And I'm just like towels, you know, 
everything. Like food, she started putting food in the thing. It was like we were adopted children. We're just sitting there going, okay, Lord, I guess you want us to go in a motorhome. And I literally got to lead this other sister in her new motorhome up to her nephew's graduation in Oregon where we were there. And I got to pray over Lonnie, which was the best part because those of you know Lonnie and they, they, they come every uh, year, Lonnie and Penny. And he's got stage four cancer. And so we heard the word as we were traveling. I said, Lonnie, we're just going to come to you. And he's like, what? And I'm like, I don't got a motorhome. I can go where I want now. You know, we're on our way towards that way. So we just swung to Susanville, California, in Northern California. And we got to go and, and visit them and leave the motorhome with them. And, uh, and then we flew back. But I was like, Lord, you, you're really cool. You gave us a motorhome. Now what am I supposed to do? He says, you're supposed to go home and tell everyone you're taking a, a sabbatical. No way, Lord. That's crazy. 27 years. I'm going to go home and have 27-year anniversary. He goes, nope. You're done. So today I'm here to tell you I'm going to start a new adventure. Starting this week, we're leaving on a sub summer sabbatical. And uh, we already have a motorhome. It has everything in it. And I don't mean to shock you, but I, I already a lot of you already knew this, so it's not new news to you. But some of you, just to let you know, I'm not quitting serving the Lord. <laughs> I kind of feeling I'm going to serve him a lot more in this motorhome, but I'm on for a different adventure. I don't know what to call it, a, a missions trip slash sabbatical or, or just, I'm not even sure sabbatical works on this one, but I'm putting that in there in case I get a week off, you know, to, to, to rest and uh, see what the Lord has. But I'm really excited because already we, of course, we passed through Twin Falls uh, and we went to, to um, our dear brother, Mike Kessler, wanted me. He's like, if I would have known you were going to be there, I would have made you preach for me that Sunday. Because he, he wasn't there. <laughs> he was driving away from Twin Falls as we were driving toward it. And we pull in. We left on Saturday morning. We got there on a Saturday night. And we're like, we don't have anywhere to stay, Mike. He goes, go to the church. Park in the parking lot. It's totally safe. You'll be safer there than any other RV place, you know. And he had the radio guy run a power cord out to us and plug us in. And it was really peaceful, by the way. Jen says, you know, of all the places we visited, I like Twin Falls the best. I thought that was weird because they were trying to get me to switch pastorates with him. And, and, and then they put me on the board of CSN. So I know God has some plan. So I'm probably going to be speaking at Twin Falls soon. You guys can, and don't worry if you want to still hear me. We have enough sermons recorded that you can, the kids are going to continue to be putting them up on YouTube and you'll see it on Facebook. And on the road, I hope to do words of encouragement more because we have that other channel, words of encouragement, where I highlight passages of scripture, uh, like a devotional thought. So I'm going to do a few of those from the road and put them up. So if you're willing to support us in our summer sabbatical, you know, we're going to try this. I've never done it before. I've never even taken a break. So I'm not really sure if it's a break or what it's going to be, but I'm, but I'm willing to find out. So don't come here next week. So I'm here to tell you, hey, sorry, but I had a big announcement. Aaron has been asked to speak up at Grace Community. They got their new pastor that kind of overlapped. He was supposed to speak on that Sunday, but the new guy came in. But he knows that in the right timing, if the Lord wants, he'll speak there. And uh, we got our dear brother here visiting. Now, he's, what, he's already on the worship team of Grace Community, but he has a food truck and has a heart to feed the homeless. And I couldn't be more excited because here Jan's heart is what, what's going to happen to the feeding. And I'm like, the Lord already knows. And literally called me while we were gone and left a message saying, Jorge left me a message saying, you don't know me, but I love the Lord and I have a food truck and I want to feed the homeless on the, at the old airport. And I heard you already do it. So I just invited him today. He, 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 he played hooky from Grace Community's worship team just so he could be with us. I thank you for that. And uh, he, got to he got to be part of the feeding. And he's got a vision to make it even bigger and to do stuff. So if you want to work with them, please do, you know. And it it, like he says, it takes a village, you know. It is he wants to do a group called Men of Valor, Mighty Men of Valor, that would step up and help those in need. And, uh, and so he's one of the Gideons also. He, he, did you know he's one of the Gideons too? Yeah, he's one of the Gideons. So these guys have that in common, and they'll, they'll be continuing to serve the Lord. There are guys here that will continue serving the Lord. There's a lot of other fellowships. You guys already know I never teach we're the only fellowship. 
or just one of the fellowships. So for the next couple months, please plug in somewhere and be willing to walk in divine appointments for your lives. And if you don't mind supporting us and you're behind us, then that might contribute to us coming back. We've been really, really going, you know, Lord, this lack of provision thing, <laughs> you know, kind of been rough because since everybody dug out during the VOG, our, our ties have been down. I don't know if you, what? A few people died, Dottie and some others that we really loved. And, uh, and it kind of feels like the Lord's going, hey, you're, you're not, I, I'm like, did I sin, Lord? Am I doing something wrong? He's like, no, I just have something else I need you to do right now. So I don't want you to think, hey, I don't love you and I don't want to be part of your lives. I think I'll be part of your lives just from as we're traveling. And my wife is really good at Facebook. I'm not. <laughs> so if you write me on Facebook and you don't get an answer right away, I did, I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you. I don't whatever you speculate. I just don't do it real good. She, write to her. She will tell me. Everyone knows this. It's like, you got to talk to Izzy, call Jan. Then Jan hands me the phone. <laughs> it just works that way, okay? I'm just not that, uh, I'm not in love with tech quite that way, if that makes sense. But I'm in love with people. And I'm in love with being used of the Lord. And I've had the privilege of being used of the Lord for 40 years now. And I guess he's just given me a different assignment. I told him, if you, if you do the motorhome, you get us the motorhome, then maybe he wants to go. And I didn't even know this, guys. I've been married... 32 years going on 33 years this year and my wife tells me this last year she said I always thought when we got older we'd get a motorhome and go do stuff we're not older. I, I said <laughs> she said we're not older <laughs> I said, we're 55 I mean yeah see this these are gray hairs I earned these no she says I always thought we would do this I said you know, you could have mentioned this. I thought I was cuckoo. Like, I'm upstairs looking on the internet at these pictures of motorhomes going, Lord, what's the right one for us? Like, if we were going to ever do this, I can't breathe here. During the VOG, I was like, I can't breathe, Lord. you got to deliver me. That and, and, made and the discomfort made me willing to look. Yeah, now Jen goes, it cleared up, now we don't want to go. Except that now he gave us the motorhome, so should I go? And in my spirit, I know I'm supposed to. So there, I have a feeling there's some divine appointments that lie ahead. Our house and kids are still here. Yeah, our house and kids are still here. We could use your support to keep <laughs> them alive. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the motorhome's paid for, so don't worry about that. And, uh, and, and it came with all the tubes and all the stuff that we need. So we're grateful for that. You just put fuel in and you go. And, uh, and we're grateful. We're really grateful that the Lord is God. It makes it exciting to serve the Lord. It makes me so excited that our brother here has it on his heart to do the feeding because that takes a big pressure off Jan. You know, she, he can continue Martin doing it. And the kids, I, I want to give commendation to my kids that stepped up and did it while we were gone. They told them they and have to. yeah, she's, Jan was very specific. You don't have to do it. And they did it anyway. So I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud of Kainoa and the gang just keeping things going. And I, I'm excited to see what will the Lord do. So while we're gone, would you please do me a favor? I, I wrote this while we were on the mainland. Don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves. When you, you know, the Bible says that's the habit of some. They go, I don't need to go to church. I'm still a Christian. I believe. I can do it on my own. No. What were those four things they devoted themselves to? Apostles, teachings, breaking of bread. What was that other one? Fellowship and prayer. You need fellowship in the Lord. You're not an island. You need fellowship. And, you know, if, if you get sweet fellowship here, that's great. But you can still fellowship with one another. You can trade numbers right now, and you can hang out while we're gone. And Diana's still doing the women's study tomorrow night. Yep. And uh, it's, what was the title? I forgot the next book. Be Ye Transformed. So see Diana I'll for tomorrow. tomorrow. Jan will be there tomorrow. The next week we won't be because we have a and ticket. <laughs> Jan will be FaceTiming in so the BE transform. So, yeah. So Jan can have fellowship from the road. I know we will have fellowship on the road too if we just obey the Lord. And uh, I'm excited. I'll, I'll touch base with you if you want to. And, uh, you know, we, we'll let keep you updated. I'll try to put some st stuff through Jan on our church website on the Facebook. And, uh, and we will continue. 
yeah. But we're really excited because it seems like, God, you're doing something. So I got to just obey. And if the Lord wants us back in a, you know, we're just calling it a summer sabbatical. By the school year, we got to be back for Raquel. Or she has to go online. Who knows? I don't actually know. I'll let you know when he tells me. You know, the problem is, is that he, a lot of questions and not a lot of the answers. You know, all I know is just go. It's like go to the desert. Road. All I know is just do the first part. Everyone wants me to tell him, tell me more of it. I go, I can't. He didn't tell me anymore. Like, how do you tell more of what he didn't tell you? Th this is the part. If I can lead by example and show you, later I'll have a great testimony what he did. But only if I do the first step. Okay? And I, I, I can't preach it to you if I don't live it in front of you. I cannot. I'm not one of those guys that says, do as I say, but not as I do. You want you? Those of you that know me know I'm. I, that's my mo. I I I walk what I what I talk. And if I don't, don't even bother following me telling you about the Lord, because I'm here to show you how to do it. And and I'm here to show show you. It's exciting. It's really exciting. I mean, 27 years he's given me four children. Now I got a son-in-law added in, and life is awesome when you obey the Lord. Not, e did I say, was it easy? Because I didn't say that. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's some real hardships, but it's still awesome. So, would you guys, let's close with prayer. And uh, Father, I want to thank you for the privilege to serve you for 27 years. And I pray your spirit would help us as we go into the next season of whatever it is you have for my wife and I and our family, direct our steps. And I thank you for this body of believers that you've given me the privilege to, to help lead. Help me continue to lead by example. Show us what you have for us and direct our steps. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.